I think that movies depend so much on rhythm. They are so close to music, a movie is. Clo closer to music than a drama of the theater. That uh, if the sound and the rhythm of the sound, above all the rhythm, is wrong, no image can, can save it. It's not only what you say, but the rhythm and speed of all the voices in a scene. So I often, when I direct, turn my back on the scene. Welcome into Tales of Cinema, the podcast episode 7. Oh, it's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Oh, in the name of God! Now I know what it feels like to be God! Today I've got a great adventure film as well as a great novel adaptation and a film that you can actually watch with, uh, with your kids and have a, an intergenerational experience. I'm going to talk about the 1956 Moby Dick, directed by John Huston. Choose any path you please, and ten to one that carries you down to water. There's a magic in water that draws all men away from the land, leads them over the hills, down creeks and streams and rivers to the sea. The sea, where each man, as in a mirror, finds himself. So it was, I duly arrived at the town of New Bedford. As usual, I'm going to talk a little bit about the director himself, John Huston. He was an American film director, screenwriter and actor. Uh, he was born in 1906 and died in 1987. He first studied art and particularly uh, painting at the Art Students League of Los Angeles and he also went, uh, went in Paris for a number of years. He had many, many different uh, interests, uh, including art, cinema, psychology, English and French literature, um, horseback riding, opera, I believe, was something he liked a lot. Theatre was something he was also very interested in. Uh, so um, he, he was always uh, fed by all those different influences and interests, which will give his films a, a very peculiar, unique look, because... Um, being a being a student of of painting, being a painter himself, that's how he will approach most of his films as as paintings. Though in the way he will work with color, work with uh, composition of the frames, and um, and the editing. Uh, it's very much the work of a painter filmmaker, uh, we could say. As many filmmakers uh, at the time in the thirties, forties in America, he started as being a screenwriter. He wrote a number of films, including High Sierra in 1941, uh, directed by Raoul Walsh with Humphrey Bogart. He's most known for one of his first films um, with Humphrey Bogart, an adaptation of The Maltese Falcon. If you haven't seen that film, watch it. It's a brilliant work. Once again, as many other f American filmmakers in the 40s, John Huston served in the United States Army during World War II. Uh, he was specifically making films for the Army Signal Corps. What uh, Hollywood and the, the, the American government wanted at that time was to have uh, professional filmmakers with a unique view who could uh, create propaganda films for the morale of their soldiers, basically. And, um, <laughs> and John Huston will have a little twist on this. Uh, he made three excellent films during that time, Report from the Aleutians, 1943, The Battle of San Pietro, 1945, and Let There Be Light, he's most known, in 1946. And they were all, in one way or another, censored or banned or, or messed with by, by the army and, and, and the American government because Houston was uh, giving a, 
not a very bright uh, side of uh, of what he saw um, he was uh, involved into into battles he was shooting during battles so he he saw action he saw combat he saw terrible terrible things uh, and that will have an effect on on the rest of his career after coming back to Hollywood, the first film he directed was The Treasure of Sierra Madre uh, with Humphrey Bogart in 1948. It's a must-see if, if, if you haven't seen that. And, um, and then he will make a, a number of uh, films considered uh, amongst the greatest ever made. So Key Largo in '48. The African Queen in 1959, Beat the Devil in 1953, The Unforgiven in 1960, The Misfits, The Knight of the Iguana, and The Man Who Would Be King. Oh, those are just a few titles amongst the most known and the most renowned and the most um, loved films that he made as a director. So I mentioned before he's, uh, he has a sen the sensibility of a, of a painter more than anything else and uh, he was al always referred to as a, as a rebel, always talking about taboos and heavy subjects. I mean, just watch The Misfits and you will see all the, uh, all the themes that will become explored by the counterculture at the end of that decade. Uh, he was already on it uh, with a film like The Misfits. As a filmmaker, was also um, fascinated by the human nature, by uh, by the losers. Uh, often, his films depict losers and how they get beaten by a system they they think they understand, but eventually their own um, selfishness will destroy them. Basically, religion is central in his films as well. Uh, whether it's uh, the blindness that you can have through religion, um, the, the narrow view of the world that you can have, or the freedom that it can also give you. Yeah, we'll explore that, this paradox, um, what it means to be a religious person, what, what freedom means. It was fascinated, obviously, by, uh, by war and the effects of war on the, on the psychology of men and soldiers and uh, people who lived, just civilians who lived through war. Colonialism is also um, a central theme, whether whether it's a film like The Man Who Would Be King, where it's the, the center of the story, or uh, films like The African Queen, where, where it's more hidden, more subtle, but still there. So that's the kind of themes he was fascinated with, and we're going to see how Moby Dick fits into this, because Houston was also, um, was also a huge literature fan and uh, made a number of novel adaptations. Ahab. Ahab, come out in moonlight. Strange. Only at night, every night, all alone, walk in the deck. So let's start straight away with Moby Dick, released in 1956. It was co written with the author Ray Bradbury. Uh, apparently, they didn't get along with each other, Bradbury and Houston, at all during the, 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 the whole making of the film. The film stars Gregory Peck as Captain Ahab and Richard Basehart as Ishmael. There's also a cameo by Orson Welles as uh, Father Maple, um, which will be a role taken by Gregory Peck himself at the end of the 90s in a miniseries about Moby Dick, another adaptation where Gregory Peck will uh, switch his role to, to Father Maple. So first of all, um, like I said before, it's a great film that you can watch with your kids. I would say start around six years old. From that point, they're, they're old enough to understand what's happening and to, uh, to not be... I'll be honest with you, there's a couple of graphic scenes, uh, but you, <laughs> it's obviously fake. Uh, it's an old film. And um, from, from six years old, kids can make the difference between what's real and what's not and be taken by the story, basically. So start with um, around six and you can, you can have that uh, intergenerational uh, experience on a Saturday night or on a Sunday afternoon with, with your kids and maybe the grandparents and, and have the whole family watching a great adventure film. It's an adventure film like we don't do them anymore. Very straightforward grandiose, all shot on location with 
tons of extras in the in the opening sequences actually shot on the sea for most part of it well except the the battles with the whales obviously it's made with miniatures um, in a in a tank, a water tank in a studio, but the rest is shot on the sea, and it makes the whole difference. As we said before, John Huston uh, is a visual artist. He's a painter before, so uh, in the way he composes his frames, in the way he works with color, and in that regard, Moby Dick is um, a true gem. The work on the color pay re a really good attention to it. it it's obvious that it's made by someone who has a, who has knowledge of painting who has knowledge of visual art who has knowledge of the composition of the frames you have someone you have an artist behind so that's also a good film uh, to start showing what an artist is to kids um, because you can feel there is someone behind the camera directing you look directing what you should feel at which moment and uh, and um, and make you think basically because art should ask questions and not give answers and uh, and and Houston is a champion in that always questioning things for all the fans of the book out there uh, it's a good adaptation but not a transposition so uh, there's always that issue that troubles me with adaptations where uh, people who adapt them and, and and the audience as well tend to um, prefer somehow to see really faithful adaptations in terms of Evans' characters and following closely the story and everything. They, they seem to want to see what they read but on, on screen, the exact same thing on screen, which is, to my opinion, not interesting at all. Uh, it's not an adaptation. It's, it's called a transposition if you do that. And to me, that has, that has little to no interest the point of making an adaptation is to um, think about the essence of the work you are adapting. Tackle the same similar themes and have have um, the main scenes of that of that original work in there. But uh, all this has to be done through your personal view. That's what to me makes an uh, an interesting adaptation. Something different. Something that you haven't seen or read before, but reminiscent in essence to the original work. And in that regard, once again, Moby Dick is really great because uh, it has everything you have in the book, the, 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 the overall structure, the characters, the, the themes of madness, of religion, of uh, that, that captain ready to lose all his men just to pursue one big whale. All this is in the book as well as in the film. But Houston, being an artist, being someone who thinks, incorporated uh, all his obsessions and fascinations in, in there. So there's a bit more about the religious aspect, the mental state of uh, Captain Ahab, and, and all that sort of things. So a good adaptation and not a transposition. That's something important. Yes, of course, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit dated when it gets to the chasing scenes and the action scenes because they were done with miniatures, and you obviously can tell it's a 1956 film. After all, it, it was done 65 years ago, so as long as you accept to be fooled. Um, because we're not fooled, uh, whether we are adults or kids, we're not fooled. We can see it's miniatures, we can see it's a film, we can see it's all fiction. What's important is to accept to be fooled and to get in the story. And if you do, you will take out a lot of things out of this film. Regarding those action scenes, uh, once again, I have to warn you, uh, they can be, a couple of them can be a little bit graphic, although you see they are miniatures, there's a bit of blood, and yes, they are chasing and hunting whales, something that is forbidden now, something that we all agree is bad, is not something anyone should do, whales should be protected if all things, but what's important is the book was written in 1851 in a, in a different society with different ideas, and the film reflects that as well. What I mean by that is those characters um, are doing a job 
Uh, they are hunting whales to make money, to give a comfortable living to their families and communities. Therefore, they do not see what's, what they are doing wrong. Uh, they're not doing anything wrong, according to them, especially at that time where you had many, many more whales that, you, that we have now. So they don't see the wrong of what they're doing. Do scenes are presented that way. Uh, it's a great adventure, there's a joyous music, and uh, it's all portrayed very straightforward in a non-cynical way. And you have to accept it. It's not because it's, it's portrayed as it would have been at the time that Houston is saying it's fine to hunt whales. On the contrary, uh, that will be explored later in the film uh, in a more subtle way, in, in, a, in a questioning of all this. So that's important to go through the scenes first. In a way, it's a bit like Jaws. Uh, I think Jaws was quite influenced by Moby Dick um, with a similar character of, of the captain and the, the big monster at the end and all, the, all that stuff. But it's important to accept those scenes as they are and uh, do not, don't, don't turn off your, your Blu-ray, don't turn off your TV as soon as you see those scenes because you think, uh, oh, it's not something we should do and we should show to kids, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. You're missing the point if you do that. Uh, the point is to go through the scenes, uh, have a great sense of adventure. Just watch the eyes of your kids while they will be watching this film. They will have sparkles in their eyes. They will go along with the suspense, the thrilling, the chasing, the adventure, the songs, the colors. Uh, they will want to play with boats afterwards for days. They will annoy you with that. But at the same time, it will play on their mind and they will, they will ask you a few questions about this uh, very innocently, like kids, of course. But... That's the point of this film, and it's important to let them go through those, those uh, graphic scenes. Uh, don't, don't take them as babies. Kids are not babies. They are kids, they have their own mind, they can think, and they can feel, and they can make their minds for themselves. Uh, they just need a little bit of direction, and that's what that film does, and as a parent, that's what you can do with that film. Special word about Gregory Peck's performance. It's incredible, it's really impressive. Uh, if only for one thing, uh, just watch the film. If you're not in particularly interested in visuals, in uh, visual storytelling, colors, and, and all that stuff, um, at least uh, you will enjoy Gregory Peck's performance as the, the mad Captain Ahab. Uh, it's an impressive, habited, almost demonic, almost, uh, yeah, almost religious, full of life, full of energy. It's a pleasure to watch, quite simply. <laughs> Yet he is but a mask. It is the thing behind the mask I chiefly hate. The malignant thing that has plagued and frightened man since time began. The thing that mauls and mutilates our race. Not killing us outright, but letting us live on with half a heart and half a lung. It's available on DVD uh, in a few in a few retailers here and there uh, for uh, a very affordable price. However, if you have a Blu-ray player, I would recommend the um, uh, Blu-ray edition released by Studio Canal a, a few years back. Uh, very very good um, transfer Blu-ray transfer. It's lacking a little bit in extra features. But it's a good copy of the film, um, and the colors the colors really pop out uh, with this uh, with this transfer. So it's available a bit everywhere. You can go to your nearest shop. You can order it from Amazon, eBay, a lot of different retailers. Uh, it's a, it's a good edition to go for the Blu-ray edition of Studio Canal. Just to summarize a little bit, it's a great watch with your kids. It starts so start around six years old. It's a, it's a great film to watch with the, the entire family. Watch it with your kids and with your own parents as well, if you can. If you can. Uh, that's a, a great film to watch with different generations and to share with each other and then to talk about it and to let the kids um, have their own adventure through that film, to let them live it and then come up with uh, with a few of their questions regarding what they saw as a, as a visual art, as a visual storytelling, but also some of the themes of the film and uh, the whole the whole debate about the, the, the whale hunting and all that stuff. Um, so it's a great watch with your kids. It's a great adventure film, an old school adventure film like we don't do them anymore. Um, it's a, a good adaptation and not a transposition. A good adaptation of the Herman Melville's uh, Moby Dick novel. 
Um, Gregory Peck is awesome, and uh, and it's a perfect uh, example of John Huston's work as a visual artist. Great use of color, great framing, great editing, and uh, full of the, the, the themes that obsessed John Huston throughout his life. So definitely a great watch next time it's pouring rain uh, during an, a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Just get your, your whole family together, uh, get some popcorn and drinks and, uh, and enjoy. Thank you very much for listening this podcast and staying up until the end. Um, give a like to the, to the podcast, share it to everyone you think will uh, find it interesting, share it to other parents uh, because it's a film a little bit uh, forgotten. Uh, but I think it's a film that can make a strong impression on kids and, and, and maybe, maybe provoke uh, vocations. Who knows? So thank you for staying with me and uh, I will be back very soon. Goodbye, everybody. Pledge yourselves, heart, soul, body, life and lung. As I pledge myself, death to Moby Dick.